already. So let's now head on and let's talk about MRI of the menisci. I might get interrupted a little bit here. They're going to come to uh, put a new steering wheel on my car. I'm supposed to get here about 3.30, so I might have to leave for a second. So the menisci, first thing we need to know is uh, that the menisci are actually important structures. There was a time for a while in the medical profession felt that the menisci of the knee were superfluous, superfluous like uh, an appendix or something. Uh, but we now know that they're important for load, sh load sharing across the, the knee joint. And we'll talk about why that's important when we talk about articular cartilage disease. They work as shock absorbers to protect both the cartilage and the underlying subchondral bone. Uh, they're secondary stabilizers, especially if you don't have an ACL. And as we'll talk about, one of the big problems if you tell your ACL is that that uh, leads over time to uh, increased risk for tearing of the menisci, which can go on to uh, further degenerative disease. They're important for proprioception. And as we'll talk about as we go through different lectures, especially the spine lectures, proprioception and the importance of <clears throat> fine-tuning the position of the bones through muscles whenever you move is very important for protecting uh, the ligaments as well as uh, cartilages that uh, 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 that are involved in the interface between different bones. They're important for joint lubrications and they're also important for articular cartilage nutrition. So the menisci are actually important structures within the knee. Uh, now, uh, one of the biggest <laughs> diseases that we talk about in terms of menisci, which you've all heard about, are meniscal tears. So I'd like to talk a little bit about tear types. You can also get cysts. You can have abnormal discoid uh, meniscal shapes, which we've already talked a little bit about. Uh, and then we'll talk about allografts and some pitfalls in MR imaging. Now, this comes back from uh, an early paper we did that we published in 1987 from data that we collected in 85 and 86 when we first put in an MR scanner at Cedar sinai Medical System, uh, Center here. And we did an arthroscopic study uh, with, uh, we did two studies at that time. One was an arthroscopic study that we did with Jim Fox, who's an old friend of John Yergudis is here, who's an orthopedic surgeon who was one of the early our knee arthroscopist, <clears throat> uh, where we compared MR findings with arthroscopy findings. And then we did a study, and that's where David Stoller was a resident at Cedars, uh, where I, uh, David and I did a study where we uh, did MR scans in cadavers that we snuck into the MR scanner. And then with the pathologist, we looked at them under the microscope to see what the signal uh, was associated with. And I'll show you some of that data as well. So that this is uh, so initially when we did our first paper here, I was kind of trying to decide, you know, how you should go about doing it. So I decided, well, if we're going to compare the MR findings to arthroscopy, the arthroscopist can see the superior and inferior surfaces of the menisci. So maybe what's important is if the signal goes to one of the surfaces or not. So we graded signal into three types that we saw commonly. One was if, it, if there's increased signal intensity within the meniscus, in this case it was on T1-weighted images, extend to the articular surface on more than one cut, and these were three millimeter skip one millimeter cuts at that particular time. Uh, <clears throat> uh, that, would, uh, that would be a grade two, uh, I'm sorry. Grade one signal is where we just saw uh, signal inside the meniscus, but it didn't go to one of the articular surfaces. Grade two is when we saw signal intensity within the meniscus that goes to the peripheral surface. And here I thought that might be important, but it's not something the arthroscopist is going to see, so I'll make that a separate category. That's grade two signal. And then grade three signal was when it went to an articular surface on more than one cut, because sometimes it was very tenuous. We felt that if it's two or more cuts, then uh, it's going to be a real structure. Uh, at that particular time. And then we uh, compared it to arthroscopy. This is what that signal looks like in the cut specimen at pathology. If you look on cadaver menisci, and you can see the abnormal uh, color of the uh, meniscus in the same location where you see the abnormal uh, MR signal there. Histologically, this is normal uh, uh, meniscus, which is, it takes up a lot of the eosin stain. You have these interspace regularly positioned 
chondrocytes to, to keep the, the ground substance uh, <clears throat> healthy and so forth. These areas where you do not take up the eosin stain much is abnormal tissue, and that's early, a sign of early degenerative disease uh, where the substance uh, uh, it does not have normal biochemistry and therefore does not take up the eosin stain properly. And this is what we see in those areas where you have increased signal intensity uh, <clears throat> within the, the meniscus. And then grade two signals where the meniscus went to the periphery. These were all actually, uh, these are images all from that initial study from 1987, 86 and 87. Where you can see it going to the periphery like this. We called that grade two signal. Uh, here's just what some uh, MR scans look like a little bit later in life when we got a little bit better quality imaging. Uh, female, and this this was actually uh, in phase and out of and water images where you can see the in increased signal intensity does not go to one of the articular surface, but does go to the peripheral rim. So this is what on more modern imaging uh, that grade two signal is going to look like. Now I'll, I see a lot of people using grades one, grades two, and grade three. Uh, I've kind of always assumed that the orthopedic surgeon really wouldn't know what those grades are, but may maybe they are used enough where they do. I, I just like to say if it's grade one signal, I'd say increased signal intensity, which does not communicate with an articular surface, compatible with intrasubstance degenerative disease. Then we kind of tell people what it is. Grade two signal like this, I just say is linear signal, goes to the peripheral margins, but not to one of the articular surfaces, compatible with intrasubstance degenerative disease and no terracene sort of thing. This is what I like to do. And then this is what a grade two signal looks like. And on the gross specimen, and I'm sorry this is out of out of focus, uh, but we can see this is what it looks like. You can see that same signal on the cut specimen of the meniscus going to the peripheral area, does not go to one of the articular surface. Histologically, we found much more disorganization of the ground substance, much more loss of the normal chondrocytes. So this is a more severe disease we found in general uh, histologically in these menisci than just grade one signal. Okay, so here we can see this is a 48-year-old male. I'm sorry, it's, let me see if I can get rid of this. Yeah, uh, who is a tennis player, had increased signal intensity with exercise. We just see maybe a little a grade two signal. Personally, I wouldn't put this up to the category of being abnormal signal. I would call this a pretty normal meniscus myself. Uh, uh, but this is what happened uh, a year or two later, and we can see the development of a lot of diffuse increased signal intensity within the meniscus, which does go to articular surface, but it's not really linear. Uh, and uh, uh, this is uh, development of degenerative disease within the meniscus, probably due to rep repetitive trauma from uh, from the development. Now, <clears throat> I personally, in a situation like this, like to say it's diffuse increased signal intensity. It does go to the articular surfaces. Uh, <clears throat> but in lieu of some of the data that we're going to talk about shortly, I say this is most compatible with intersubstance degenerative disease. It's not discrete, uh, but a tear cannot be excluded. And that's because we now know, as opposed to back in th this particular time, is that uh, this is degenerative tearing of the meniscus. You may or may not see tearing when, when it's this diffuse at, at arthroscopy, uh, but these patients, it's more degenerative disease, and there are several studies now that show that these patients are best treated non-surgically. So that's why, uh, uh, as opposed to in the early days when we started doing all this work, uh, we really felt that menisci needed to be uh, treated surgically with partial meniscectomy because we thought that abnormal meniscal tissue in there would irritate the cartilage and lead to cartilage degenerative disease. Now we know that as long as the meniscal tissue is stable and you don't have something, a loose body flipping around in there that's going to tear the articular cartilage, that actually even abnormal tissue is protective toward the articular cartilage. And therefore, the more tissue you leave in taste, place that's stable, even if it's abnormal tissue, uh, the slower the progression of degenerative disease is. John, do you want to make a comment on that? Um, uh, there was a time when, uh, when we used to remove um, the meniscus in total. Yeah. Um, when we found the tear, um, and of course, we didn't have MRI, we had CT scan and arthrography. Um, but uh, 
if if we suspected a tear and, and there was chronic pain, an effusion uh, is, an, uh, for, in my opinion, is one of the most um, um, dangerous things to have in the knee. I, I, I'm searching for a word. Dangerous is about about as good as I can get. But anyway, um, if you have uh, effusions on a chronic basis, uh, intermittently, uh, that is a signal to to to, to um, the doctor that uh, this knee more than likely needs surgery, whether the meniscus looks okay on MRI or not. So, a continuous uh, swelling and pain, uh, whether the meniscus looks normal, uh, needs an operation. Uh, nowadays, we repair these, uh, but that we'll, we'll get to later. But anyway, uh, uh, we didn't have anything like this uh, until 1985 or thereabouts. Okay, thank you, John. And then the third type is grade three signal, which you're all familiar with, but it's linear increased signal which goes to one of the articular surfaces on more than uh, two cuts. Uh, and that's really grade three. What does this look like? Here's a gross specimen. You can actually see this is the tear plane. This is a typical degenerative tear. It tends to be horizontal in location. Uh, Smiley, uh, Smiley, one of the early, well, in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, was an orthopedic surgeon in England who published a lot on meniscal disease. He's the one who believed that you never did a partial meniscectomy as either total or none. Uh, but later on, arthroscopy came along where you could do partial meniscectomies, and that all changed. But uh, he believed that there was a different coefficient of friction between the top and the bottom of the meniscus, which means in normal uh, wear and tear activity, especially when you have weight bearing, that produces uh, shear forces through the substance of the meniscus, which over time leads to breakup of the micro of the collagen fibers, which leads to degenerative disease and these horizontal uh, tears like this. Uh, so if you take, um, take the last one right there. That's a total meniscectomy. Uh, uh, it, it, we don't see it the anterior horn, but uh, we do see most of the meniscus. Yeah, well, that, and, uh, this was a cadaver knee. Yeah, as you, as you can see, um, that degenerative uh, uh, disease uh, yeah. in, in that area where John is pointing, uh, that, that can be painful and uh, can be intermittently painful or just just painful all the time and uh and effusion is in the name so this is the kind of uh, teaching that uh, we received in those days in the six early 60s late, late 50s you removed the entire meniscus yeah and this is what it looks like if you just have the cut specimens kind of a kind of what you would see on an MR slice. You can see the tear right through here, and then all this uh, abnormal siglantensity is all the degenerative tissues. Now, what studies, histological studies have shown is basically, uh, well, never mind. I'll talk about more about that later. And then if you look uh, under the, the specimen under the microscope, you can see these big cleavage planes within the meniscus. And then you, get, you can get these clumps of regenerating chondrocytes. And notice how abnormal the surrounding ground tissue is. This is all very abnormal. Uh, and this is due to chronic longstanding degenerative disease, which is then developed into a tear. And that, and then, that also shows micro tears right. um, in meniscus. And then this was uh, another paper we did in 1988. Uh, where we compared the accuracy of MR with arthroscopy, and we looked at high field and low field, and we found compared to arthroscopy, sensitivity for MR was about 95% at high field, 91% specificity, and at low field, 88 and about 85. Uh, the one thing we now know from more work is that arthroscopy is not a perfect gold standard. Uh, so arthroscopy and MR are now believed to be similar in sensitivity and specificity. There are some tears that are hard to see by uh, 
arthroscopy and some that are harder to see by, by MR. Uh, so now I'd like to go through the tear types and there are a number of different ways in which tears are described. And uh, right now, actually, the Society of Skeletal Radiology is trying to, has got a group together to try to come up with some sort of a standardized nomenclature. Every time we try that, nobody, you know, most people never ex uh, accept it. But anyway, uh, that's undergoing now. But uh, classically, uh, a lot of description were horizontal cleavage tears, which are, uh, we'll talk about a degenerative type, a parrot beak tear, which is another degenerative type, bucket handle tears, flap tears, peripheral tears, more complex tears, and muscular capsule separations. Now, what's, what's really important in today's time is, is whether it's a degenerative tear or not degenerative tear, and then if it is a tear, is it stable or unstable? Because degenerative stable tears, which is the vast majority, are no longer considered surgical, and insurance companies, at least in the U.S., will not pay for the surgery if you do that. If it's an acute tear, it's surgical, but the, uh, the appropriate treatment now, if at all possible, is to repair it and not do a partial meniscectomy. And then if you have a degenerative type tear that's unstable, those don't heal very well, so those typically are treated by partial meniscectomies now. We sent many, many people to surgery in the early days of MR without realizing this, many that got partial meniscectomies, uh, <clears throat> and we now know that if you have a large partial meniscectomy, uh, if it's degenerative, that leads to increased risk for more rapid development of degenerative disease in the D. So, and we'll talk about some of that data as we go forward. So degenerative tears include the horizontal cleavage tears, most but not all flap tears, and parrot beak tears. So what do they look like? We already saw one. This is an older example of a horizontal cleavage tear. And this is the old days when we just had film. So uh, what we would often do with, with film is we'd look at the whole uh, knee uh, on the regular film images, and then we'd have the text uh, just coned down into the meniscus, do uh, uh, much more narrow window widths uh, just through the meniscus, and we could see these horizontal tears through the meniscus. You know, now everything's read electronically, so uh, you don't have to do that. Okay, so here's a question. Uh, Robert, is, is this a, a tear or not? Uh, that's a good question. It looks like there's increased signal in the posterior horn, what looks like the lateral meniscus. It's probably the medial. Medial. Um, so we see the signal here. It may go to the peripheral surface. Yeah. Uh, we don't really see all that, so we have to look at all the images, obviously. Right. We look at other images. We see something like this where we're getting a lot of artifact. This is on a one Tesla uh, <laughs> extremity scanner. And here, it's really, you know, we just have very poor signal to know it, so it's a little hard to tear. Uh, tear or no tear. So this is what it looks like on the MR examination with a little bit of things going to the surface. <laughs> Arthroscopically, what we're seeing here is that that free edge looks fine. And if you look on the undersurface, it looks fine over here where we thought the signal might be going to it, mm -hmm. but there is a little bit of a peripheral tear there. And if you stick the scope back there, what you'll do is you'll fall into an intersubstance tear. So we used to worry a lot about these kinds of things in a walk like this. Uh, now more and more here we just describe it. So it's most likely a degenerative tear with blunting of the free edge like this, but we don't see any flaps. So this would be a degenerative tear, but it's probably not a surgical lesion. Okay. And actually at surgery, we made it work. Uh, they actually, uh, for this, what they did is that they did not do a partial meniscectomy, because to do a partial meniscectomy would mean they'd have to remove most of the meniscus. They just put some sutures in the periphery here, uh, hoping that that would help stabilize it so that it would tear. With, with yeah, well, this is a capsular. Uh, separation plus tear. So, what you do is, is suture the capsule to the meniscus and close the gap there. Yeah. So now, that doesn't come in. Now, let me uh, ask, ask uh, let's see, uh, Elior, let me ask you a question here. Now, uh, there are 
kind of three zones of the meniscus that the arthroscopist talks about. One is the white, white zone. That means if you see a tear, you don't get bleeding on either side of it. And those are tears that are typically in adults in the middle third of the meniscus. Then you can see tears in the meniscus where the peripheral side can bleed the central side close to the, uh, uh, does not bleed. Those are called red-white tears. And then there are peripheral tears in the peripheral third of the meniscus where both sides bleed, and those are called red-red tears. Now, this is one out in the periphery, so this should be a red-red tear. Elior, why is this not bleeding? Because the, the peripheral third of the adult meniscus is vascularized, and that's why you get the bleeding. So let me just ask you, why is this not bleeding? Um, hmm. Well, I mean, is it, does it tell you how acute it is? Is, is this a chronic tear? Maybe? This, this is a trick question. Uh, and that is because when you do arthroscopy of the knee like this, you put on a... Uh, a uh, tourniquet. A tourniquet. Thank you, John. A tourniquet uh, so that you don't get bleeding. If you took the tourniquet down, yeah. this would start bleeding. Okay. Okay. So, uh, and then it's generally believed now that red, red tears have a high likelihood of healing. So some people will go in and operate on those and put in sutures to, to uh, uh, protect them, to make them more stable so they're more likely to bleed. Uh, but it's very important that those not to do a partial meniscectomy because you have to remove too much of the meniscus. Uh, if if you can get away from it, but you, well, you ha you can't really make that de determination until you're actually in the knee. John, if, if you're looking uh, to see if there's a bleeding, you can remove the uh, 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 gas from the from the tourniquet, and uh, uh, that 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 tells you whether you're bleeding or not. Right. And then you put the turn so back that's up one and way to tell it. But ordinarily we don't bother with that because we just go by um, location rather than trying to test for bleeding. Thanks. One of the things that bothers me uh, with this uh, joint is if you look at the tibial plateau, you see some rough areas. Um, and that's not smooth. So uh, the articular surface is damaged, and the future for this knee may not be as good as you want. Thanks, John. Okay. All right. Um, okay, and then we have uh, flap tears. And here you can see this is actually a vertical tear through the meniscus. Uh, if the meniscus were lie down flat, it would be, you know, like you cut it. Uh, uh, <clears throat> and then we can see that the, the free edge here is unstable, moving in toward the notch of the knee. So this would be kind of a vertical flap tear. If you do an MR scan in the sagittal plane right along the edge there, what you'll see is an elongated piece of meniscus like we're seeing here. And this was a former radiologist in Santa, Santa Barbara, uh, an early uh, MR scan where we can see this is a typical appearance of a flap tear. If you go to the coronal images, here you can see that displaced flap tear in the joint space, and here's that separation between the two. So that would be a cut right across here, where you see that central fragment in the, in, within the joint space separated from the peripheral rim. And so this is, this is an unstable flap tear. Uh, these tend to be very symptomatic. Uh, this will tend to move around and, and irritate the articular cord. So even though this is a degenerative tear, this is one that people still think would be an operative candidate to, to stabilize that and not have a loose uh, flap fragment within the joint space. So that's a horizontal flap tear. Here we can see, here's a I mean, that was a vertical flap tear. Here we can see a horizontal uh, tear within this meniscus, also an old case. And then here, what happens here is the superior uh, flip flips back on itself. And this is actually the free edge, which should be down here. 
Uh, but instead it's flipped back on itself and the free edge is pointing up over here. So this is another uh, uh, flap tear, less common than the previous one, but it's also unstable and even today would be considered a good candidate for repair. Here's kind of an example of someone who has a, uh, a horizontal tear going to the superior articular surface, a lot of degenerative disease as you can see uh, in that uh, knee. And here, well, when you have these kind of tears, often what you'll see is fluid collection here. There should be meniscus here. The free edge should be there. It's actually flipped back up to here instead. And uh, uh, you really shouldn't see any big collections of fluid within the normal knee like we're seeing here. So this is an indication of a, of a uh, flap tear. And here we can see. And, and that's a youngster. Uh, the physics are open. Yeah, right. Okay. Uh, so what do you see here, Robert? So we have a uh, axial and sagittal of the knee. And it looks like there's a flipped fragment into yeah. anteriorly or anteral medial. Here, uh, you can see it going up here. Mm -hmm. And in this particular case, it's connected to the anterior horn of the medial meniscus. So this is a big, a huge flap tear involving most of the uh, medial meniscus, which is flipped anteriorly here. So this is another situation of a person. These are almost too, always too degenerative to be able to repair. So this is one where you'd have to do a large partial meniscectomy. Uh, this one, you can probably bet that it's traumatic. Yeah. But it was, I think, older. If it's acute, really acute trauma, so you like to pick these up early, then they may not be t very degenerated and you might be able to repair those. So you really like to try to repair them if you can. And you can see here that the body of the medial meniscus is very small because most of the meniscus is flipped anteriorly there. And it just this patient did this own meniscectomy. Yeah. <laughs> Elior, what do you think of this case? So, um, looking at the lateral meniscus, it looks like it's extruding uh, in the superior coronal yeah. recess. Yeah. And also, yeah, that's is that that's part of the meniscus as well. It's not the <laughs> it's not the ACL. So you have a very small peripheral rim here. Again, this is another vertical tear, and the meniscus is flipped into the notch of the knee up and through here. So that's a big displaced uh, flap tear. Okay, so uh, you can get vertical longitudinal tears, and if they complete to the surface here, then this, this can displace and get the kind of flap tears we've just seen. Uh, or it may not go all the way to the surface, in which case we get another type of tear that we'll see in a minute. You can also get degenerative tears that involve the body here, often the body at the junction of the body and posterior horn, uh, which are little oblique tears here. Uh, They're uh, commonly called flap tears, kind of named by Zarens, who was an orthopedic surgeon back on the East Coast. Uh, but it looks they have these little beaks called a parrot beak tear. These are degenerative type tears uh, as well. And sometimes these are unstable enough where it's best to kind of trim off that beak depending upon the patient's symptoms. These can be somewhat subtle. Here we can see a nice sharp edge, anterior horn, posterior horn. When we get to the body, we can see some uh, lack of distinctness there. And if we look on the coronal images, you can actually see that there's abnormal signal along the free edge. Uh, and this particular patient right there, what this looks like arthroscopically is this. This is that patient. And here you can see that fibrillation of the free edge. Uh, so generally now, uh, these uh, where we just see signal intensity like this along the free edge, we'll call that fibrillation of the free edge. Nowadays, most of the time, these are not operated on uh, because it's, it's small and uh, it's not really a large displaced fragment. So uh, having more meniscus there is thought to be more protective. Now, when, uh, when you look at this here, what you see actually is... Uh... A loose fragment that's a, a fibrillation of the meniscus, 
But the main problem is the meniscus is folded on itself from posterior to anterior, and it's uh, on, on top of the medial portion of the meniscus. Now, uh, that, that you cannot uh, live with uh, and, and, and do any sports, etc. Uh, and, and and that what what happens is the knee gives way, pops and, and makes noise and and uh, you may even fall. So that you have to remove, okay. uh, and there's no way to fix that uh, that I know of. Thank you. Uh, so here's another example where we can see the little free edge tear on the sagittal and the coronal images. Uh, this is the uh, uh, the same person's opposite knee, which was normal, and we can see the normal free edge versus the fibrillation or small free edge tear. Okay, Th this happens. I don't know how they say parrot beak unless you actually see it on the on the axial view. Right, which is uh, not always easy to see on the axial view, depending upon whether the slices are perfectly positioned or not. Okay, uh, let's see, who, who was last? I think it's my turn. Okay, Jason. Okay, so we have some fluid sensor fat set sequences of the knee and coronal, I think more yeah. anteriorly. So, so this is the son of an orthopedic surgeon in, uh, who practiced in Santa Barbara. And his son went to UCLA and was a running back. So this is uh, April 5th, 2008. Okay. Um, there... images. Okay. Now this is where I trained and used to take care of these guys. Yeah. We have a thinning of the uh, anterior horn closer no, to we the We don't root. really see the anterior horn yeah. here, right? This is really the bodies because we're in the coronal okay. plane. Okay. So That's not really that point, isn't it, John? This is a little posterior here. You can see okay. the fibula. Yeah, do you see the fibula? Yeah, so there's a little bit of blunting there, the free edge. See, it's sharper here over here. Yeah. On the, on the medial side, this is the lateral side. If we go to the sagittal images, you see the anterior and posterior horn look sharp, but when I get here toward the junction of the body and posterior horn, we can see a little bit of irregularity there. So we call this a small... Uh, free edge tear in, in that location. Go to the T2 weighted images, you can see a little fluid there, uh, which goes along with that. Uh, so then he went to surgery, uh, and this is what the post op films look like. Um, post operative? Yeah. So we still see the blunted. Pre edge. Okay. So let's go back to what it looked like. Here's what it looked like before. Oops. Here's what it looked like before and here. This is what it looks like postoperatively. Okay, so we have an additional gap right there. Okay, uh, so we can see they removed some meniscus the here along the free edge yeah. and more blunting of the body right there. There, if we go to the sagittal images, here's what we now see of the sagittal images. So, very diminutive uh, posterior. Horn, very yeah. So they removed a lot of posterior yeah. horn, and uh, uh, so this was yeah. So this was on six seventeen oh eight, and now uh, this is six eighteen oh ten. So this is now two years later. What do you see now? Two years later, uh, I see cartilage loss of subcontral. Yeah, so he gets part of his loss there. We're seeing probably some uh, fat coming down and probably a uh, subcontinual osteophyte there. A lot of cartilage loss. Uh, back here, you can see the blunted articular, uh, the blunting of the of the meniscus and, uh, and a little bit of subcontinual remodeling. So maybe a little bit of early degenerative disease, uh, but he was not able to go back to playing football again. After <laughs> And as we'll talk about it in, uh, in a little bit, papers have looked at athletes, and it's what they find is uh, there's a much higher percentage of athletes who are able to go back into the same level of sports if they do meniscal repairs than if you do partial meniscectomies. But we'll get to that data in a little bit. 
And the municipal repairs really weren't available back in those days. That was before the techniques for primary repair really became more sophisticated, which is just over the last decade. Okay. So we have a 34-year-old hockey player uh, with knee pain. I'm looking at the posterior horn. Uh, looks like there's a horizontal tear inferiorly surfacing. Right. Going to the free edge. And then, okay, so this is 4-2-2012. This is 9-11-2012. Uh, looks like there's been some development of, again, uh, I guess, degenerative changes of, of the knee. There's some con uh, cartilage loss and some chondral edema. Yes, yeah, regular the cartilage is here all along there. There's a little bit more blunting of that uh, meniscus. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, that's, that's the development of degenerative disease. So we know that having a, uh, an abnormal meniscus can lead to degener degenerative disease. We know that ligament tears can lead to degenerative disease, and we know surgery can. So uh, that's one of the things that we will follow. Uh, so, Elior, what do you think of this case? So looking at the posterior horn, it doesn't seem to be any abnormal signal. Okay, very, very subtle here. This is basically red is negative. Here are the coronal images. So, on the, the medial side, is there, yeah, there's some abnormal signal in the body. Yeah, so there's a little bit of intrasubstance signal here, but it doesn't seem to go to the surface. There is probably mm -hmm. a little bit of cartilage disease here. And this, so this was on 7-30-2007. This is red is mild intrasubstance degenerative disease, but no tear, and a little bit of a probable grade two to three chondromalacia of the medial femoral condyle, right, right in there. Okay, so now the patient came back uh, six months later, and this is what it looked like. Well, yeah, in the posterior horn, it seems like there's, I mean, it, it has a truncated appearance. Okay. Um, yeah, either, yeah, it looks like there's a tear on the undersurface of, of that posterior horn. Well, I'm not sure. The tear. There's a little bit of signal there. Mm -hmm. The other thing, if you go back here, let's look here. See the cartilage? What does the cartilage look like now? Yeah, it's completely denuded. I mean, and if we go to the coronal images, this is what it looks like. So what does it look like on the coronal images? Yeah, it doesn't look like there's any cartilage, maybe some edema. Yeah, so it's, it's completely denuded. This is only six months. And so what happened here is that the patient had a partial meniscectomy uh, right after the previous MR scan. Even though it was called no meniscal tear, they did a partial meniscectomy, and now the patient has a lot of degenerative disease of the residual rim and extensive grade 4 chondromalacia of that medial compartment. And this is only six months time period. So you can get pretty rapid destruction of the articular cartilage uh, after partial meniscectomy. And so uh, here are a number of studies where they've looked at the development. Here, here are studies that show that if you have a meniscal tear, it's strongly related to the development of osteoarthritis, uh, which basically is a loss of the articular cartilage. So multiple papers at uh, multiple journals. And then uh, and then this just shows a partial meniscectomy uh, also is highly associated with uh, worsening of uh, uh, MR signal intensity on, on T2-weighted images. <clears throat> and so it's still debated as to how big of a risk factor uh, partial meniscectomy is versus a degenerative tear, but it's pretty widely regarded right now that uh, uh, more than a minimal partial meniscectomy uh, is significant risk for the development of loss of the articular cartilage. Pardon, partial meniscectomy uh, was introduced um, in about uh, 1970. And uh, prior to that, we used to do total meniscectomies on 
any tear of the meniscus. Uh, Smiley made it known to everybody that it, uh, he was an army surgeon, by the way, after the Second World War. He, he said, if you don't do a complete meniscectomy, uh, you're doing a, the patient harm. So then um, about 1970 or thereabouts, uh, I don't know if it was Harvard or, or Mass General. His Mayo Clinic. One, one of the institutions uh, well known Mayo Clinic. had 250 cases of partial meniscectomy and they compared them to total meniscectomies uh, in, in other cases. Uh, and they showed that the partial meniscectomy was much better in terms of results. But uh, down the road, we find out that if you wait long enough, it probably makes no difference which one you do. Okay. So, Tyson, is it your turn or um, did you just do the last one? Yeah. Uh, so, 58 year old female, 40 years after total medial meniscectomy with 20 years of competitive long distance running, followed by 10 years of impact aerobics. So, total medial meniscectomy, I mean, I, I do see a little bit of meniscal tissue where the yeah in the body right there but very diminutive and very small posterior horn and anterior horn left there as well um what do you think of the cartilage you know the cartilage is not as bad as i thought it would be i do see some signal alteration uh, but i don't see a, a large chondral defect right. so you know uh, human beings don't always like to read the textbooks and their <laughs> knees are different uh, this is someone who had a total meniscectomy when they were 18 years of age after a traumatic injury uh, on a parachute uh, event. And, uh, but she continued to be very active and uh, did not develop uh, a lot of degenerative uh, disease of that, of that compartment. And we'll talk about why that may be the case when we talk about the... the uh, metabolism of cartilage and actually how being active might uh, have actually preserved her articular cartilage here. But so we'll get to that later. So, uh, so question here, <clears throat> Robert, what is the prevalence of MRI findings of meniscal tears in asymptomatic individuals? <clears throat> I mean, I guess it would depend on the patient's age, but... Good. I guess the older you get, the higher the prevalence. Let's say somewhere like around 30%. Okay. So uh, this is a paper a study by Bowden in clinical orthopedics. And what shows, surprisingly enough, in asymptomatic teenagers and young 20s, there's a 14% chance of having a meniscal tear by MR. Gets a little bit less in uh, later years. The highest is between in the 46 to 65 and then a little bit less than when you get to 74. But it's important to remember this, because one thing, you can have teenagers who have meniscal tears but have no symptoms. And uh, generally, you don't operate unless, uh, you know, the patients have symptoms. And the other thing to realize is, since you can have meniscal tears and no symptoms, it means that when you see someone on an MR scan who has a meniscal tear, you still have to try to figure out whether that may be a cause of symptoms or not. And what we found in some other papers that I think I'll present in other lectures here, in my early days in, in Santa Barbara, uh, we were noticed that a lot of people who came in with, a lot of young athletes who came in with trauma did not have meniscal tears, but what they had were bone injuries. So I, I believe in, in young uh, sports injuries, it's actually much more common for the knee pain to be caused by, by bone injuries. But the bone injuries weren't recognized until then. In fact, we had one of the first papers to show that uh, you can have X, normal x-rays in someone who actually has uh, symptomatic bone trauma. But we'll, we'll talk about that when we get to the bone trauma times. And uh, what we now know is that the vast majority of MR meniscal tears are asymptomatic. And unless they're really grossly unstable, they're probably best left alone. 
Okay, now what are associated with symptomatic tears? Well, age is important. Uh, whether or not you have an unstable fragment, we've already talked about. And then we need to talk about whether acute versus chronic tears and also the perimeniscal cysts. Uh, Elior, what do you see here? Uh, we see a complex tear of the posterior horn. Okay, and, and what is a complex tear? How do you define that? It involves multiple planes. Good. That's great. So this has both vertical and horizontal components. So that's really a, a complex tear. We can see that there's an unstable uh, meniscal fragment here. So this is one you'd have to be very concerned about. And this was probably one that was symptomatic. And they went on to a partial meniscectomy. Okay. Tayson. Yes, ma'am. Oh, okay. Uh, I'll be right back. Excuse me. I give them the price and allow them to join in there. Oh, good. Thanks. Let me just check with you. I'll be back in five minutes. I didn't get to meet you guys at the party. <laughs> yeah, no, I was uh, I was sitting at the uh, same table as you, just the opposite end. I think you were talking to my uh, my best friend um, for a little bit. One thing about uh, tears of the meniscus is uh, how symptomatic they are. And uh, if they're asymptomatic, you leave them alone. Uh, if they're symptomatic, it depends on, like I said earlier, um, effusions, pain, giving way, and so on. Uh, they usually have a problem that needs fixing. Uh, what that fixing is depends on what the MRI shows. That's what's a wonderful thing about MRI. Uh, orthopedic surgeons took quite a while to uh, develop a liking to MRIs. Uh, they came out around 84, 85. Um, orthopedic surgeons, arthroscopy-wise, started arthroscopy around 1970. So we had a, a, a bit of a lead on that. Um, fixing these before MRIs. Hi, John. Okay. Tayson, what do you think of this case? Um, so we're at, we have sagittal cuts of uh, the knee here at the level of the ACL. So, I mean, there is this triangular low density over there, which looks like a low anterior signal. horn, but it's low a little too, yeah, low signal intensity. Okay. But okay. it's a little too central. Okay, it's a little too central there. If we go farther out, this is what the lateral meniscus looks like. Okay, so the anterior horn has a blunted free edge. Um... So do we have a flap tear? Well, this uh, is well. This is actually a tear that just displaced. So that was a tear of the lateral meniscus. You can see this is the free edge. This is the body. If you take this and plug it in here, it fits in very nicely. Okay. So this is a just a tear, and again, it's that that area where you can see fluid collecting, which you shouldn't see. May have to make you very suspicious that you have a tear if you see fluid like that. Okay. So this was a displaced fragment. Uh, uh, this uh, uh, blunting is uh, the giveaway. Yeah. Uh, when you see blunting on a meniscus, you know there's a tear or a prior meniscectomy. Okay. Uh, and that's kind of an acute tear, but that's that when it's completely displaced like that, it's probably not surgically correctable. Okay. Okay. So we have a coronal of the knee, and it looks like the medial, sorry, the lateral meniscus is, body is blunted. Okay, onto to there. And then here's another cut a little bit more anteriorly. Do you see anything there? Um, looks like there might be something close to the intercondyl or not, but that thing? Right, yeah. What do you think that might be? Might be a loose fragment. 
Okay. <coughs> That's what it looks like on the stir image on these low field images. Here are the sagittal images, and this is it up here. Mm -hmm. Arthroscopically, if you go in, this is what it looks like. So it looks pretty massive. Arthroscopically, it's to be kind of subtle on an MR scan. It's not so subtle arthroscopically. And there it is. And then when they removed it, this was a large flap tear that was almost three centimeters in length. So it was a massive flap tear, though it's pretty subtle when you look here on some yeah. of these images. So you just have to realize that uh, some of these big tears can be subtle. But if you go back and look at it, it's all there on the MR scan. So, uh, so therefore, we need to dif be able to differentiate between degenerative tears and non-degenerative type tears. And the main reason to really uh, tear the difference is <clears throat> if you have an acute tear and a normal meniscus, the margins are going to be very sharp and you're going to have low signal intensity all the way up to the tear. If it's a degenerative type tear, it's you're going to have much more diffuse increased signal intensity within the meniscus. So if you see something that's very sharply defined like this, it's most likely acute, and you've got to be thinking in terms of a primary repair, especially if it's in an athlete. So that, that's what we can see is just a little bit of a vertical uh, <clears throat> radial type tear, which is right here involving the anterior body. Uh, if we go to the thin images, these are one millimeter contiguous images. You can actually see these much better. Uh, <clears throat> and for a while, we were doing these thin 3D images. But uh, overall, we found that didn't really help that much. And they're a little bit worse signal to noise. So we kind of stopped doing them. And then, but you can see that the, you can see some of these small little, little tears like this. And I generally thought that if you uh, repair these, you'll have improved healing, even if it's in this central portion. And if you don't repair them, they can uh, proceed to tear because you have a stress riser here uh, where you'll get anterior forces on this part of the meniscus, posterior forces here. That'll end up putting a lot of stresses right on this uh, point, right in this location, and you'll progressively get more and more of a radial type tear, which can end up being a complete tear. And those have a very bad prognosis. So that's a vertical. Here, here we see another of these vertical tears, uh, radial type tears involving the free edge. And here we can see <clears throat> that that's that uh, stress, stress riser where you get right there. Here you can see separation of the more central uh, uh, fragments. And again, the concern is that if you don't treat this, it can progress all the way through. And at one time, people were just trying to smooth these out so that you didn't have a sharp point here. Now, more and more, they're trying to repair these to get the meniscus back to a normal appearance. So these are acute radial tears. The margins are nice and black. And so generally, these are you try to go in and repair these. <laughs> if you can't repair them, then you can do a partial meniscectomy. And there are, are different techniques to, to repair these. And uh, it used to be we had to remove them completely. Uh, in terms of uh, shaving that area and just yeah. rounding it out, um, make it smooth and so on. But now we are able to fix these. Good. Uh, in, in the past, we didn't. But the, the medial uh, compartment is Takes very long. tight uh, and uh, compared to the lateral, yeah. to the, I mean, even the lateral compartment. And um, so it's more difficult to repair these than uh, it would be on the medial side. Um, Thanks. And, uh, uh, I, I would allow the patient to, to, to rest for a couple of months before I would allow them to do much of anything. Okay. Uh, Elior, what do you think of this case? Um... I see a defect in the uh, body of the lateral meniscus. Um, yeah. Okay, so this is kind of central close to the to the free edge and then here out close to the periphery. Mm -hmm. And there we can see it. And that's a, and then if we look on the coronal images, there we can see some of the body. Here we see no meniscus, and there we see the anterior horn. So this is really a complete radial tear. And here you can see the tear goes all the way through. 
Now, there are fibers that we're going to talk about now called the hoop fibers, which are thick longitudinal fibers of collagen that go uh, longitudinally around the meniscus, and they hold the meniscus in proper shape so that it, it can actually uh, mechanically act as a uh, shock absorber in the knee. When you have complete tears of all the radial fibers, it becomes floppy and it no longer can protect the knee. So here are these hoop fibers. See these longitudinal fibers that go all around, especially in the periphery of the meniscus. Those are the longitudinal hoop fibers. <clears throat> these are uh, very thin 3D images done using a, uh, a, a ultra short TE technique. Uh, and now, with this particular technique, we can see those longitudinal hoop fibers. We also see these shorter little things here. And it turns out these are areas of calcification within the cartilage. And it turns out that as you use the ultra-short TE images by MR, we're much more sensitive for, for calcification than we are with CT. Uh, because you get a lot of uh, blooming artifacts. Just one second here. Hello? Yes. Oh, let me just come down. I'll be right there. I'll be right back. How's your like my pens? Anybody there? What did you say? I'm sorry. I'm um, I'm asking how you guys like my my pens. You were there on Saturday, your right? Pens. Oh. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, I, I I like mine. It's very patriotic. It has the American flag on the other side of it. So. Some of them have a stylus for it. <laughs> Works well on an iPad. Yeah. But they're they're not not exactly cheap, and um, they're pretty good pens. Yeah, no, I I have it in my backpack right now. It said, of course, it was uh, stolen uh, from you. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, no, a patient of mine, uh, years, uh, quite a few years ago, you, uh, we be became friends. I used to send me pens all the time, and uh, I caught the disease. So uh, now I now I do that, and everybody in my neighborhood where I shop or whatever, they all know me. But, because of the pens, <laughs> and they all rush to see to see me and help me. Sorry about that. Okay, okay so these are the shoulders. Okay, so why don't we stop here, and we'll pick up here tomorrow. Okay. Sounds good. Um, Thanks. Tomorrow, John? Uh...